Okay. Um, good afternoon, everybody. Um, I'm Kirk Greenbaum. Um, this is our class, uh, The Business of Communication. And uh, our first guest speaker in our class is Arnie Robbins, uh, who I worked with at the Post Dispatch, and he was the editor there. And uh, I'm not going to do a long introduction of Arnie because you had that available to you in the um, in the Blackboard lesson plan. Um, uh, however, if uh, we get around and start opening it up to st questions from students, I would like you all to introduce yourselves uh, briefly. You know, name, major, year in school, that sort of thing. Um, so again, I'm recording the session and we'll go ahead and get started. Um, start with an easy one for Arnie. Um, why did you get into journalism in the first place? <laughs> um, probably like a lot of students do, or a lot of people, when I was growing up it was a very different era in the 60s, loved sports, uh, grew up in Cleveland, Ohio, read about the Cleveland Indians every day, uh, couldn't wait to read the newspaper. My parents were newspaper readers. Uh, they read the morning newspaper and the afternoon newspaper and just grew up in a household where people read newspapers, loved them, um, worked at my high school newspaper, um, and just sort of got into that habit at a very early age. So, um, fundamentally, do you think that the work of journalism changed much between the time you got started as a journalist and the time you, I'll say, semi-retired? Um, I mean, or was it just a matter of adapting to technology? Yeah, I'd say mostly adapting to technology, but, I mean, it has changed a lot from I started and I went to school to uh, Northwestern in 1971, graduated in 75, and while it, it is mostly technology, when you think about it, at that era we had typesetters. So we would do a story, a reporter on a typewriter, then a person at this giant sort of mainframe computer who was called a typesetter, then he or she, it was really mostly he's then, would type it in again and then that would go to the composer. They'd print out a thing, basically, and then with glue it would get put onto a page. So yeah, it's all technology, um, you know, but the world has changed so dramatically, you know, that it's, it's more than that also. But it's still journalism. It's all about, really, when you get right down to it, it's about distribution. How do you read your news? Do you read it on your phone, uh, on your tablet, on your computer? Uh, hard copy through social media, you know, I mean, all that journalism and the, the, you're right, Kurt, at least in what you were intimating, that the basic fundamentals still apply. Are there um, periods or stories during your career that you look at where you were particularly um, proud of the work that you had done or something that, that you look back at fondly? Um, in your career, either as a reporter, as an editor, as the editor of the Post Dispatch, I'm sure. Yeah, I mean there are a lot of them actually, but you know a couple that come to mind slightly more recent. And um, when I was out of the Post Dispatch on the night um, in Kirkwood, when a man came in and shot, I think it was seven people. Um, that was early in, you know, quite frankly, newspapers were not doing much on social media at that time, um, and we did a lot on social media. We broke stories online. Um, then in print, we did many variations of the story. We had, I believe we had tweets out then that Twitter was in its infancy. So we were attempting to use our toolbox, even though we didn't, you know, quite frankly understand totally what our toolbox could do or was. Um, so that, I think, was a pretty seminal moment for people realizing you know, the, the digital monster, um, you know, really is how you needed to inform uh, readers and viewers. You know, so that is one that really stands out. You know, there are a lot of others when I started out in sports, when I was executive sports editor in Minneapolis, the Star Tribune, and when I was managing editor of the Post-Dispatch of World Series victories and Super Bowl victories, that was more in the sort of realm of fun. Um, you know, but those are two things, and then any investigative report, I mean, you know, really what you live for is great investigative reporting, 
uh, again, it goes toward the fundamentals of journalism, but what can we do to make a difference in our community and great investigative reporting that has impact in a community and that can help institute some change, um, you know, is just something that always makes you feel good. So, I, you, you raised an interesting point, I think probably um, obliquely in that answer, and I, I want to bring it up to the to the forefront, I think, a little bit more. All of us, when we get into journalism, you know, as reporters or young editors or whatever, um, I think we're very focused on the news room and the business of, or the practice of journalism, and not many of us think much about the business of journalism. Mm -hmm. Was there a time when it sort of clicked for you that it's not just about going out and uh, breaking stories and um, writing wrongs and that sort of thing, but there's also got to be a, a business component to it. Yeah, I mean, pretty early on when I, w I was sports editor at a pretty early age in Minneapolis at the Star Tribune, and um, we went through a, re a small frankly, recession, uh, the economy in 86, 87, 88, that area. And all of a sudden, we had put the brakes on. We had had growth and growth and growth. And it was a one or two year blip because then actually the economy got great and we did tons of hiring. Um, but all of a sudden it was, geez, I have to understand the business of, um, of this industry. Um, later on, for sure, um, I just lost your face, Kurt. I'd, oh, no, you're at the bottom now. Um, that... Um, you know, when I became managing editor and then editor, you were just infinitely involved with it and um, just really having to understand budgets, the economy, the newspaper economy. And when you get down to it, every business, you know, is struggling with all of this now. You know, look at what Amazon has done to the best buys of the world and to bookstores and you name it. Um, Every industry is going through this, not just the news industry, uh, a period of disruption. So, you know, we all at different levels understood it, you know, but the ball kept moving. You know, it's a, it's a moving target. So it's not something that you could just get your arms around. Um, and I'd also say that it's about lifelong learning that, you know, I think when I was a young pop journalist, I just always thought, okay, I'll, I can master this, and then I've mastered it. I don't have to learn anything the rest of my life. Yeah. And, you know, not the case. Um, every, it used to be every five to seven years, I think, technology would change, the business would change, you'd have to acquire new skills. Now that five to seven year period seems like it's, you know, five minutes to seven minutes that you have to learn new skills or that there's something new coming out because all of a sudden somebody says, Hey, do you know you can do this with Google? Or do you know you can do this with your phone? Or do you know you can do this? And, you know, they're just apps being developed and developers are out there inventing things all the time. You, you mentioned a couple of things that we're actually going to talk about a lot during this class. And just to give you a little context, Arnie, we, we started the semester four days ago. So um, you're, we're very early in, in the class right now. One of those concepts that you mentioned is disruption, and that's going to be something that we're going to spend quite a bit of time talking about. Um, I just want to point out, you guys um, who have joined us, uh, we're, we've started with Arnie Robbins at 1.30. We'll be done at 2.30. Um, remember to mute your microphone if, you're, uh, if, you're, uh, if, if it's not already muted, because I think we're picking up some ambient noise behind some of you. Um, I don't know. I think Rashad, if you're there, um, try to mute, mute, mute your microphone if you could, please. Um, so we're going to talk a little bit more about disruption, but I want to ask you, you, you also mentioned um, sort of the business model of newspapers that um, existed as you were um, coming up. Um, it, was a, it was quite a bit um, focused on the idea of scarcity. You know, we had, we had this this, there was a scarce resource, which is printing presses, and we had the control of it and the ability to um, to decide what was going to get on our presses and what wasn't. And so how does that translate into the latter-day business model for newspapers? 
Sure. Um, I mean, there, there are a couple points to that. You know, one, the newspaper model was really based on uh, reader eyeballs and advertising. The more eyeballs you get, the more advertising dollars you get. And, you know, to be brutally honest, in some days, advertising dollars were easy. You know, it was the old department stores would run eight to ten pages of, of ads. Sunday classifieds made a lot of money. In, in fact, they made something like 50% of the revenue of all advertising came on, on the, all of Sunday advertising, not just classified. But Sunday classified was huge. You know, it's Specifically some, cars, jobs, and um, autos, or uh, real estate, yeah. Okay. And so newspapers made a lot of money, um, and that was their business model. At that same time in the 80s, um, they were all becoming, you know, a one rich person in town would own a newspaper, and corporations were starting to buy them. They were becoming publicly traded. When you're publicly traded, you have to show growth year over year. For a while, it was a great, you know, revenue stream. You know, there was more money than what the rich guys had. But eventually they couldn't keep it up and then during recessions, let alone disruption and you know that started in the 2000s, um, there wasn't enough money you couldn't show year over year growth. When that would happen, basically you have to cut costs. So to cut costs it's people. Costs at a newspaper in the old days was a disproportionate amount was spent printing presses in circulation, um, delivering a paper to your door, to your doorstep, which is what they used to do. They don't anymore. They throw it out somewhere in your driveway. Uh, <laughs> they used to deliver it to your doorstep. So, and then reporting. I mean, in the seventies, reporting staffs were pretty damn small. They weren't all that bigger than now. But between nineteen eighty-ish and maybe two thousand seven, they just grew like mad. So. The advertising model is really what changed. Newspapers never made a lot of money from circulation because we were always cheap. You know, they'd be a quarter, then go up to 35 cents and 50 cents. You know, a Snickers bar would be 75 cents on a vending machine then, and people would pay for it. But if the newspaper went up for, to 51 cents, people would, oh my God, what have you done to me? Um, so. I think that was a real challenge. Now, with advertising, the advertising model has gone kaput. The advertisers, yep. the yep. best yep. buys of the world, can talk directly yep. to, their cons yep. to their consumers. To their consumers. I'm getting an echo I'm getting chamber. An echo chamber. I don't know why, but, but um, keep, um, keep going. It's okay. Okay. So, so they can they, can, they talk directly. They talk directly they don't have to advertise as much. 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 They don't Gave information, information away, away to, that we just that can't do that, can't anymore. Do that anymore. That's a, that's that's industry. Industry. So the model, so the has, model to be, has to be from revenue from revenue from Hang on just a second. I, I need to ask my son a quick question because I think he may be taking some of my bandwidth. <laughs> Okay, sorry about that. So, okay. yeah, you're you're okay. you're you're talking about the idea. I mean, it, it, this goes back to the idea of scarcity. Um, if you if Best Buy wanted to talk to customers, they had to come through us. But now they don't because there's so many avenues that they can pursue online um, using um, mobile apps or whatever uh, in order to uh, in order to uh, get get at those customers. Yeah, exactly. Um, exactly. You know what? You know what? Again, it's like yeah, a lot of people think about the beer industry. 
industry, the wine industry, wine industry, in wine, wine, a farmer makes, a farmer makes, a distributor, distributor to the wines, the wines, and then a wine store, a wine store consumer, consumer, consumer. Your, your newspapers, were the newspapers with the, and you could argue, and you could argue that if a winery, winery sells directly, directly to her, her winemaker, winemaker, could make more money, make more money. Which is quite which right quite right there. there. Having the middle man, the middle man, the middle delivery delivery distribution money. money. Even that same, that same every industry, every industry that same that same. Let me pause and see if Scott, is there a question you'd like to ask? Don't forget to unmute yourself. Okay, can you hear me? Okay, can you hear me? Yep. 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 Okay. Well, first, okay. Well, first, I'm going to feed back and forth between Arnie and Kurt. Uh, uh, so it's basically, it's here, basically here twice in about, about three three seconds. seconds. Um, um, uh, 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 but uh, at uh, 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 you talked about the, 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 the staff sizes in the '70s compared to about how they are now. Um. The, the main difference being the, the massive losses of revenue from advertising. Uh, the biggest question everybody seems to have is, of course, how do newspapers come back from that? And, and I guess the my thought has been, you know, they, they have these massive operations uh, currently that that a lot of organizations don't have, a lot of online newspapers. Do you think that's the route to go, to start to start just really paring down not just the newsroom, but the organization as a whole? Um, yeah, I would say, I mean, I, th I think you're thinking about it the right way. I think there are a couple challenges there. Um, one, a lot of the online-only publications, they are struggling making dollars, too. Uh, because, again, the consumer... I don't think the consumer necessarily agrees that he or she has to pay for content. Some people still think content should be free. Sure. That having been said, I think you're exactly right that legacy newspapers, um, you know, they own buildings that are expensive, and some of these buildings are really crappy buildings. <laughs> Batch building was from the 1920s, and they've just put it up for sale. I mean, it's a dump. Uh, where I used to work, Minneapolis, are tearing that building down now because it's adjacent to the new football stadium, and they moved to some much more modern digs. So newspapers paid lots of money there. They Many still had press rooms, um, and presses are expensive as hell. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you might be delivering 500 papers. You needed four presses, and now you have four presses, but you're delivering 200,000 papers. You don't need them. can't really sell them. Um, circulation, people pay for that. So would it be much more cost effective to just be digital only? Maybe. The issue is that most of the revenue still is from print. Right. So my personal opinion is that in the next three to five years, we're going to see more. We're going to see some places become Sunday only in print, and then be digital the rest of the week. And um, a few have done that where they're three, four days a week, mostly Advance Inc., which is, you know, Cleveland, New Orleans, uh, New Jersey, and a couple, Portland, a couple other places. So I think the issue is that if I were an editor saying, hey, we can only afford to be five days a week, the minute you do that, you tick off a bunch of your readers, and the headlines are, oh, my God, they're failing, they're dying. Then the next year, you're four days a week. Then you're three days a week. You know, I think a business model that might be more successful is just, hey, we believe in news. We're going to grow our news operation. Um, to do that, we're going to be Sunday only and then um, digital the rest digital of the week. Digital the rest of the Easier to easier say. Easier to say. You know? You know? Because there are challenges. There are challenges. Advertising. advertising. Yeah. Does that get at Does your that question? Does that get at your question? Uh, yes, it does. Uh, yes, it does. Very much so. Very much so. Great, thank you. Um, Evan, I'm going to turn to you in a second while you're um, getting ready for that. I just want to follow up a little bit. I mean, on that idea of charging for content, you mentioned earlier, Arnie, that 
you know, when we were selling newspapers for a quarter or 35 cents, I think it could be argued that we really were not charging for content then either. Um, so there was this big falderall about giving away content on the internet and right. why were we right. doing that. Um, there's a lot of reasons why we were doing that that we don't have time to get into now, but I think we're, you know, as a class, we're going to talk about that um, later in the semester. Um, have you read, by the way, the Riptide report out of Harvard um, that was done, um, an oral history of um, of the news of the news industry during the digital transformation? No, I, I no, didn't. I didn't. Well, that's that's going to be a key part of our class. I'll send you a link to it when we're done with this. Um, oh, here's uh, uh, Evan. Your question went away. Um, do you want to ask it on, or do you just want to text it to me here like this? Oh, his mic's broken. His question was basically, um, I'm going to try to paraphrase it here, and if I get it wrong, let me know. But does, does he he wants to, Evan wants to know if you see media going completely niche, or is there still going to be room for general interest news organizations? Um, I, think uh, I, think there, I think there's going to be, be general, general, general interest news organization okay. because if you cover your community, you know, if you're covering whether it's St. Louis or Philadelphia or Detroit, really your mission is cover the hell out of your community, and that means news, um, public service. Um, all local news, it means sports, it means how we live in our community. I think the part that will go away to a degree will be world and international news that they're going to get from wire services. Um, and that's a tricky thing too because I think there's actually more interest in world and, inter and uh, national news now because you, you 20 years ago maybe not. They'd be a one-paragraph brief on a uh, earthquake in Nepal. Well, now you can see it online, you know, everywhere, and I think that makes people actually more interested in world and international news. So, if you had a reporter or two at a mid-sized paper who can try to bring that home in a way that's important for your readers, I think there's some value in that. But again, I think that there will be general interest news. Uh, and can and should be, but I think there will be a lot more niche publications. So the challenge would be that in St. Louis, if 48 places think they can make money doing sports, and one does just the Cardinals, one does just the Blues, one does just the Rams, one does, you know, Wash U, one does, you know, pick those things, can they all kind of nibble away at the quote unquote mainstream and you know that's what's happening in businesses everywhere in the country now it's what happened to department stores you know like who goes to a department store to buy a couch anymore but you know 30 years ago people go to a department store and you could buy a couch you know and underwear and you know you look at it now and just think you know that's kind of ridiculous good question and thank you um, the, I'm going to follow up again on the on the paying for content thing. Uh, Juanita Gittens uh, is one of our students who couldn't be here, and she sent the question: If the Post Dispatch is to be financial solvent, financially solvent, do you think it will need to start charging for content online? And I pointed out that they are doing that now, in as much as they have the S STL Extra um, service that you can get either by being a subscriber or by paying separately. Have you heard anything about how well that's doing? Um, you know, I, any, any intelligence I, you can share? <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. I haven't heard. Yeah. But what I can tell you is there are a couple ways to do this and to charge for content. One is increase the price of your newspaper, um, and then with that you get everything online. Um, that's one way to do it. Another way is you charge only for this extra content or you only charge for sports. So I think they'll be thinking about all of those kinds of things. You know, one of the issues though is, you know, unless things have dramatically changed, um, the Post-Dispatch is financially solvent, okay? Most newspapers are financially solvent and not only financially solvent, they make money, okay? I guess it might be the same thing, but uh, they make money. 
what they don't do necessarily is make enough, either satisfy Wall Street for stock price, or a lot of these companies bought papers, you know, it's what happened to Lee, also McClatchy, they bought papers when the economy was good. The economy tanked 35 seconds later. Um, those companies have a lot of debt. Um, they have to pay off their debt. Um, if there's less cash flow at all their places, they can't pay off the debt as well. Then they have to refinance that debt. They get a bad interest rate. They don't like that. They cut costs so that they could pay the debt faster. So, you know, it's just one little part is charging consumers for, um, you know, their information. You know, but I get the New York Times once a week, and I do it really so I could read it online all week. I, because I traveled quite a bit and split my time between St. Louis and Columbia, Missouri, I read the Post-Dispatch, you know, constantly online on my tablet, and I often read the e-edition just because I want to see what the print thing looks like in the morning, but I'm also reading it online. So at a lot of places, I think we are now starting to train people, just like we trained them to expect a low-cost paper years ago for 25 or 35 cents, now we're starting to train them that, okay, I get, I pay for this, but I also can read it on my phone. I could read it on my desktop or laptop or both. I could read it on my tablet. I could read it as an e-edition or I could just read it with breaking news and, you know, that sort of thing. So I think most places are getting more money from their consumers now um, through a variety of tactics, either kind of disguised as all print or some kind of a print digital bundle. You, you brought this up a couple of times, this um, idea that um, newspapers are uh, increasingly, have been increasingly beholden to Wall Street um, as they become more public companies and uh, the idea that they have to bring back um, sh quarterly signs of growth. Uh, and you know, during the, that heyday period in the 80s that you're talking about, um, newspaper companies were showing 15, 18, 20, 25, sometimes 30 percent profit margins. Um, I can't help but think that they got fat and happy with that and Wall Street wouldn't let them invest in their future. And I wonder what you think about that, um, whether or not we've we as an industry failed to invest in ourselves and, and forego short-term profits. I'm not sure, I'm not sure if, we if we failed to failed invest, to invest in, ourselves in ourselves or if I think the internet was such a game changer that people didn't know what to make of it. I mean you could look back and I've seen a lot of people look back a lot of re, you know revisionary history that you know Knight Ritter years ago um, you know, was looking at a lot of things digitally and that were ahead of its time. You know, but quite frankly, when you're, if you're 20 years ahead of your time, it may not work for your viewers and readers because they don't all have computers. Mm -hmm. They don't know how to use computers. Um, they don't want to use computers yet. Okay. So, you know, did newspapers miss the boat on that? Were they not thinking, you know, far enough ahead. I mean, I think that's an easy answer to blame it on publishers and, you know, heads of corporate divisions. But I don't think people knew how it was going to affect people's lives, just like, you know, uh, Macy's didn't know how it was going to, how Amazon was going to affect them. Or, or the music, think about the music industry. I mean, all these industries. I don't think anybody quite realized it. You know, you know, obviously you look back now and think, geez, we should have built a strong online infrastructure. We should have charged more for our content. We should have created Craigslist. We should have done this. But it was sort of like one thing after another after another that people really sort of had no experience with and didn't know what to do about it. So maybe so that's a pop out for People, but, people, I don't, but I don't I think, think, they, think they figure it out. Figure it out. Yeah, I um, 
Yeah, I don't know if it's a cop out or not. I, I, I mean, it just it goes. Some of what you're talking about sounds very much like the whole notion of disruption. It just overwhelmed the 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 legacy uh, businesses because Google could go out and do the things that um, that uh, newspapers either couldn't afford to do or they they weren't sexy enough to do for for whatever reason. They they couldn't attract, for example, the same kind of developers that Google could attract to right. to to do things that were super cool and useful online that. Newspapers maybe just didn't weren't able to attract the talent to do that sort of thing. I mean, and that's just a sliver of of an example. Yep. Yeah. I mean, I I think you're right. And you know, nobody knew what Google like. Oh, you could search for anything. You could find out anything. You know, in the '80s, nobody knew. Um, and should actually should newspapers have gone together as a consortium? And bought Google if they had had the chance. Then, I mean, yeah, um, you know, and there are a lot of companies like that that they should have bought, you know, and and because then they would have been acquiring that sort of technology and that sort of visionary thinking. But you know, it's what's going on now with Microsoft and Apple and Google, um, even Facebook. You know that they're all sort of fighting for. Actually, they're all fighting for some of the same things: advertising dollars. Um, search is still huge, with obviously with Google, but you know they're all. And Microsoft kind of missed the boat on some things on their, you know, from Windows 95 up till now, where now they're giving away Windows 10. And when they were at Windows 95 or whatever it was, they were selling it for hundreds of dollars and making a lot of money. So. You know, yeah, newspapers did miss a boat and didn't quite have the vision that, hey, here's how it's going to change. Here's what we can do about it. But I'm not sure if they had the wherewithal to know because I'm not sure if anybody did that. I will um, interrupt briefly to tell you that one of our students is named Joel Hahn, who says, uh, I knew Arnie before he became editor at The Post though I have not seen him or his wife Terry in years uh, I guess I would like to know how you're doing uh, <laughs> but I would like to know about life since leaving the post and also my best friend Robin Spears told me to tell him hello oh, Robin right. was the vice president of finance at the post dispatch I, 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 uh, we're doing fine, we're doing fine. I, I'm post dispatch in May of 2012 and I had, um, it was just time for me to leave and at the same time, which was just really a coincidence, the uh, American Society of News Editors, which is mostly the top editors in the country, deans, um, and the top editors at digital-only publications, uh, which has operated since 1922 in Washington, D.C., was moving to the University of Missouri, and basically because they were in financial uh, duress also. Um, because the whole industry was and so they happened to be moving to University of Missouri which is two hours from my house and right when I was stepping down I was a member of American Society of News Editors forever they recruited me to um, take over American Society of News Editors with a goal of trying to get them to break even which we've done so I did that for almost three years and a couple months ago I stepped down I'm now senior advisor for the organization I work just kind of part-time um, but we go down to University of Missouri two hours from here um, once a month now. It used to be once a week. Bought a condo down there, but still live in St. Louis. So, you know, it was – so it's been a great change for me. And actually, I liked it because I deal with editors still all the time, many of whom I've known for years, some of whom I've never known, and who are, who are just becoming editors, some at digital-only publications, many who are deans. You know, and they're all going through the same things. And deans, and I'm sure just like at WashU, um, you know, a lot of universities are going through this. I personally believe universities are going to go through disruption just like the news industry did and that universities don't know what's going to hit them, that, that universities rely on brick and mortar, except for this class, of course, um, and spend a lot of money on bricks and mortar. And at some point, the question is going to be, is everything going to be done online? 
and students don't want that college experience anymore, which I personally love the college experience too, and I'm sure you guys do too, or at least I hope you all do. Um, but I think it's going to be something where universities are going to be charging less for tuition and they're going to go through some of these same issues and it'll go through state universities first. You know, one other thing I want to just, um, you know, mention when you we were talking about the business model, one thing to remember is news gathering is expensive or should be expensive um, and it is advertising revenue um, especially online is pretty cheap. You don't make a lot of money. So you need to make enough money to pay up for your to pay for your news gathering. So remember that too when you think about business models that you want the best news gathering you can. The New York Times made a big deal out of they have as many people now as they did a few years ago even as they were doing layoffs they just had different jobs and they were spending I can't remember the number but X percent of their entire expense budget was on the newsroom. I mean that is admirable and great but you still have to make money and if your money's coming in just on digital and you're not making many you're making pennies where you used to make dollars I mean you've got a business problem. You mentioned the American Society of News Editors. I did want to ask you about your time there. Uh, I can't imagine what it was like being in a room full of uh, newspaper editors during that three-year period. I mean, was it funereal? Was it um, were, was there energy? Were 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 people hopeful or despondent? Did they feel like they had ideas about what they could do to sort of right the ship? I would say I that would say uh, until about 2011, um, conferences from 2007 till 11 were pretty depressing. Um, there were a lot of things, a lot of sessions on digital and how to do this and how to do this, but it was, people were depressed, quite frankly. I would say though that in about 2012 and certainly 2013 that um, it changed and that editors, deans, um, people started seeing po more of possibilities I mean, these are people who ran large organizations, but who did lots of cuts, lots of buyouts, lots of uh, layoffs. It's not fun to do that. You know, you go to journalism school to for a lot of reasons, but one of them is not to, geez, how many people can I lay off this year? And so these are people who went through a lot. But I think over the last couple of years, there's been way more energy that, you know, from, you know, quite frankly, not so much desktops anymore, but phones, smartphones, um, tablets. You know, the tablet reading experience is much like the print reading experience. I haven't seen recent research, but a couple of years ago, a lot of people went to their tablets in the morning to read, and then they did at night, almost like it was an afternoon edition, like, afternoon newspapers are going to make a comeback. So I think that there were, um, I think people see the possibilities a lot more. You know, that having been said, I think some people were in sort of, you know, post-traumatic stress syndrome because all they did was cut, cut, cut. And, you know, after a couple of years of that, that gets really hard. I'm going to ask if Evan and Scott have any more questions, and if while you're thinking about that, I'll, I'll go ahead and ask one now, and then you can just give me the high sign if you think you'd like to ask something. But um, I mean, if you, from a from a business model point of view, um, if you could wave your magic wand, I mean, what do you think conventional news operations are doing now that they should keep doing, and what are they not doing now that they should start doing? I think in terms of, in terms of News is really the smallest area of that, but in news, and I think a lot of papers have started to do this, it's do great investigative reporting in your community. Um, stop covering everything because you cannot cover everything. Stop doing, when I was editor, especially early on and before when I was managing editor, there were many news stories that there'd be a big news story and then you'd write 20, 12 to 15 inch process stories where the top five inches was new and the next seven inches was rehash. Um, 
eventually we started to eliminate those because we had to, we had fewer people, but also they had limited value. So you got to pick your spots, you want high impact. So newsrooms, I think it's that. I think it's to be even, I think it's to think about not just being digitally first, I think it's about using your phones first, maybe your tablet second, or maybe it's one and one A, then laptops and desktops. But I would think really hard about, I think just so many people get so much information on their phones now that, you know, how do I deliver the news on that the best way possible? I think a lot of the big changes have to come from other divisions. Advertising, um, you know, I'm biased, of course, but I think there was a lot more innovation in newsrooms toward the future than in advertising departments or any other department because there it was hold on to print advertising because it was huge dollars, okay? I mean, I get that part of it. But I think now they're at the point where they have to really work with how can we do something that's going to be innovative, that's going to work for Sears, um, and that will work, that viewers will think, wow, that's cool. You know, I might one day even stop in a Sears. Um, so I think other divisions, there's a lot that they have to think about that, and I think a lot of it is the, the uh, how much money a news organization spends. I said this before, but if you're spending so much money on circulation, or so much money on printing presses, okay, how do you cut back on that? Because you don't want to cut back on, you don't want to cut seven more reporters off the street anymore. You just don't want to. Scott, anything you'd like to ask? Uh, yes. Um, so I, I understand covering less topics means you can you can focus more on a few things that people really care about and, and drive readership that way. But isn't part of the reason that, that a lot of readers prefer newspapers is is because of the the greater number of topics that that are more that are more local and in their community? Um, yeah, I think to a degree, yes. And I, again, I would say your first mission is to cover the hell out of your community. So I think you absolutely have to do that. You know, I think what's a little tricky is, you know, there have always been some stories that we'll write 20 stories about one topic over three months. And, you know, maybe nine of those we should do, not 20 of those. You know, so I'm not suggesting we just do one at the beginning and one at the end and skip everything in the middle. But it's to do a little more thinking about, is this one worth writing about or is this one not worth writing about? Um, but you are right. I think what people go to for a legacy news organization is cover the community. And one of the advantages that a lot of digital places have is they don't, they could do whatever they want. You know, they could say, okay, my mission is to cover higher education or no, 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 no. My mission is to cover politics. My mission is to cover healthcare and just go out and if you're going to be successful, then it just cover the hell out of healthcare. And there's value to that. I mean, there's absolutely value, and I would think one day, if enough of that happens, legacy papers are going to try to figure out how do they partner with those organizations and or at least do links to them. Um, and instead of everybody fighting each other, uh, and in the old days when there were two or three papers in a town, everybody did just fight the competition. But, you know, if all of a sudden you have 47 niche products in St. Louis, how do you partner with those places if you, if you go under the assumption that our job is to get news to folks, um, you know, use the other niche products too. Don't think of them as the quote-unquote enemy. Uh, kind of uh, tailing onto that, but and, and something you mentioned earlier about had newspapers created a consortium to kind of tackle the, the Craigslist and, and Google competition, my thought has been that a, that a consortium of newspapers is is maybe the only way that they'll that they'll be able to to continue at least at their current uh, state or or something similar to it. Do do you think a, 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 that sort of consortium is still possible? I think there are a couple legal challenges. One, there'd be some antitrust issues. 
So I think that is what has always made them not attempt to do that. Um, because if they did that and then it's like, okay, here are 238 papers controlling the price of classified advertising, um, I think there'd be some serious legal implications, you know, for that. You know, but you are right in that that is why some chains have tried to get bigger and bigger. That's why Gannett has grown over the years. It's like, okay, how can we use our resources in a better way? How can we share resources? Gatehouse is doing something where they have a design hub in Austin, Texas, and that place designs most of the Gatehouse publications around the country. So, you know, is that an example of cost cutting? Well, yeah, it is, um, because it's less expensive. Is it also an example of, hey, we can hire in Austin, and I have no clue what number they have, 44 really good designers who love design, and they can do kick-ass pages for the whatever Gatehouse has, 100 newspapers, some of which are common because it's about, you know, Super Bowl chili the week before Super Bowl. So you have one person design that, and 100 papers can run it instead of having 100 designers, you know, do that which, you know, is, when you get down to it, a waste of time. So, you know, there's there's some of that in terms of the efficiencies, and it is why, I mean, Gannett's been growing, but some others, like McClatchy, had a lot of debt. Their stock price has just been sinking lately. Um, Lee's stock price was actually up a little bit, and then the last couple of months has gone down again. Um, and I think when they have a lot of small papers, there's not a lot of ways to sort of control your costs between those papers. So it may be someplace like Gannett that can have a Washington bureau that serves all the Gannett papers, you know, probably helps them a lot. So there, there's something to what you're talking about for sure, and then it's a matter of how do you use that. Some of you use it for national advertising you know, that does every newspaper have to have three people or five people selling national advertising, or can you have seven people in the central office selling national advertising, and can you make it more efficient for all the places? You know, but the other part of that is, I remember hearing horror stories many, many years ago about Macy's, I think when they first took over Famous Bar here, that their, their online division, I think, was in Atlanta, their digital division, but their print headquarters was not in Atlanta. I can't remember where it was, if it was here or San Francisco or somewhere. So, you know, you're trying to sell national advertising, but then you've got digital people here, and then you've got print people here. I mean, other companies have been as screwed up or actually, I think, more screwed up than newspapers, and then that's made it harder to get um, advertising dollars as well. I really like uh, what you were talking about, Arnie, when you were talking about the idea that news organizations could kind of partner with niche publications, niche, new, niche, niche publications in a community and sort of see that as a resource that they can bring to their, their readership rather than a competitor that is somehow um, undermining what they're doing. Um, and I think you've probably read people like Jeff Jarvis who have said similar similar things about the news um, the new the news ecosystem right now mm -hmm. one of our um, students was asking sort of along those lines about the idea of citizen journalism and whether you have any thoughts about that and um, the, the value of it or lack thereof um, I wonder what you thought you know I think there's value I think there's value in it um, but like many things in a business, it's not either or. It's and, and. And in this case, it would be and, 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 and. So can citizen journalism, and again, it de depends really how you, I've heard, if you get 10 people in the room, they're going to define citizen journalism in, you know, maybe seven different ways. But, you know, a couple of differences from 20 years ago is that journalism used to be a one-way street. You know, we'd report stuff. You know, by God, we knew what was important and what you should read. And, you know, so read this. And if you don't read it, you're not so smart. Um, well, it, it's a two or three or four-way street, really, journalism now. I mean, just look at the comments on 
you know, which sometimes are, which usually are pretty damn disgusting um, on, on stories. But it, it's become, a, so you can't be arrogant about, hey, we know what to deliver, we know how and what news to deliver to our consumers, to our viewers, to our readers. So I think there's some of that. I think citizens, I mean, there have been many instances of people taking photos on their phone of a plane crash and getting the first photo. Um, and I think places are way more open to those kinds of things. You know, and news organizations have been way more open. I mean, we've seen what? I think the Washington Post and maybe New York Times also both partnered with ProPublica on some stories you know, over the last couple of years and with Politico. So in the uh, Texas Tribune, which is one of the very successful uh, digital only uh, publications. They've done, they're doing stuff now. They used to do it with the New York Times. Now the Times ended that, but they're doing it with the Washington Post. So, I mean, I think there are a lot of possibilities, and for mid sized news organizations, there's a lot of possibilities at a lower, you know, I don't know if I want to say a street level basis, but a, at least a community level basis. <laughs> Well, I think what I would say is, and I, I agree with everything you're talking about, I would say what it means for journalists is that their role is changing and not in a bad way. It's, it means journalists' job isn't simply to go out and report and write stories, but it's also to be out in the community looking for things that they can curate and help bring to the audience that they've already got. Yeah, I, and, think, I, think, yeah, I think that's yeah, I think that's. Uh, and I'd also say that for some reporters, it still is going out and reporting stuff. Um, and then for other, you know, whatever you call them, whether they're reporters, whether they're producers, whether they're multimedia, you know, the, you know, yada yada yada, it's absolutely to be curating stuff out in the community. Um, you know, because every community now has got different blogs. Where I mean, there, I live in the Central West End. And there are a couple of blogs here that I look at, and they often break small little stories that, you know, nothing with the Post-Dispatch or, you know, some big organization would care that much about, quite frankly, but something that they would want in their publication at some point in time. So I'm often sending them, you know, different things that might be just two paragraphs in the newspaper, or it might be ten paragraphs online and nothing in the newspaper even, but, you know, that I see on a Central West End blog. So, so you're right, Kurt. You're right, Kurt. I mean, one of I, I can I can tell you the moment that I realized how powerful so-called citizen journalism was, and it it was at when I was at the Post Dispatch as the, the digital news director there, and uh, it had to be nine ten years ago now, but I was I was b bombing around STL today. I happened to look in one of the forums, uh, discussion forums, and just a reader posted a Google map in there with, um, he had created a Google map showing where all the fish fries were going to be during Lent. And it's one of those things like, duh, of course, what a great idea, but we didn't think of it. Some reader of STL Today thought of it and did it all by himself. Yep. Yep. and then shared it on the STL Today discussion forum. And, of course, every other news organization on planet Earth started doing those maps uh, themselves yep. after that. Yep. Well, yep. And, well, and even more now, when you read story comments, reporters often get tips on the story that there will be some comment. Now, the danger with citizen journalism is, you know, you don't know how the, well, whether it's accurate, um, how they got that information, I mean, you still need strong ethics, um, so somebody has to really triple check all information and how it was gotten. But, you know, it's people looking at Facebook, at Twitter feeds, at this and this. And, and there are many cases, there was some famous one on Twitter, God, this is three, four, five, six, seven years ago of a plane crash, and then somebody tweets out something like, holy shit, I just survived my second plane crash in one year or in six months or something, some guy who had been in two plane crashes, small planes, and walked away from both. Well, he became a big story because everybody saw that on, online and everybody wrote stories about this guy that he walked away from two plane crashes. 
So um, we've got about five minutes left. Um, our only student left right now is Scott. Is there another question that you'd like to ask before we sign off, or are you good? You know, I, I, you know, I, I well, actually, the well, only actually, thing I thought of was, you know, in that period of, of 07 to 11 when things were looking really bad for newspapers, and <clears throat> how did you personally feel as, you know, as an editor who's, who's watching the newsroom staff um, get slashed and... And I'm not sure if this is how it happened at the Post Dispatch, but I know in a lot of places, um, as is part of our uh, reading for for this week, that uh, they they boosted advertising staff. So so you have this division of more people trying to sell advertising with less content. I got a little off track there, but but how did you feel? You know, watching watching your people being cut while some other departments were, uh, sure. weren't or, or were getting bigger. Yeah. Um, I mean, it was obviously really hard when, uh, when I took over as managing editor. So this is about 2000 or so. I think we had maybe 320 journalists, maybe 330. Um, and when I left as editor, so this would have been a good 13 and a half to 14 years later, it was maybe 150-ish. And I'm sure they're smaller than that now. A lot of those were early retirements, so people who elected on their own, but some were horrible layoffs. Um, so, you know, it's really disheartening to do that, um, to live through that. It's really disheartening to try to get before your staff and talk about, you know, how or why you're optimistic and there were reasons to be optimistic you know we were we all knew we were changing like mad and we had to change like mad so I mean you know if you were totally depressed I mean you're not gonna get any work done and you know you could ultimately choose to either laugh or cry um, and that's way too simplistic for this but you know there's some truth to that you know, at, at that time they were trying to grow advertising because it was about advertising dollars and it's advertising is really what was was falling off the cliff, which then caused us all to eliminate uh, staff in newsrooms. So the thinking was, well, geez, if an advertising person who's good brings in X dollars of revenue, let's hire five. It's just much more revenue. We won't have to do cuts. So, I mean, there was a lot of logic to it. Um, and there were when there were cuts, there were cuts... I don't know if I want to say across a board, but there were a lot of cuts everywhere, you know, but in some places like running a press room, if you have to have whatever it is, four people running a press, you got to have four people running a press. You can't get by with three or two. So, you know, I think for journalists, it was hard. It made them start thinking about what do I want to do with my life? Um, I actually still think there's a good future for journalism. Um, it's a lot more about being an entrepreneur than you know, I'm going to go work at a small paper for five years and a middle-sized paper for seven years and then the New York Times for 31. You know, it's a very different career track than when I started out. But um, for entrepreneurs, I know a lot of young people who are creating some pretty damn cool things, and some are going to good places, whether it's Sports Illustrated or the New York Times, and ones who know how to code, you know, are actually making, it's a technical term, but, you know, they're making a shitload of money. Um, going to some of these places, um, getting really, really good jobs. So, I mean, that's a job my high school guidance counselor never told me about. Oh, you could code for a computer, you know. And it's that's the part that we never had the vision of in the 80s and 90s and even early 2000s that, wow, could this make a difference? So, you know, it's every editor I've talked to talks about, before I talk about post-traumatic stress syndrome, I know a lot of editors who are just at a certain point in time they got tired and it was, you know, I did this for seven years. I did it for almost seven as editor and almost seven for managing editor. And I could look at my budget and know that, hey, there are going to be more cuts coming. And you get to a certain point where it's, you know, maybe I want to go do something else with my life now. All right, we've got one minute, Arnie, um, and I said we'd end at 2.30. And uh, let's ignore the fact that it just became 2.30. <laughs> I, I, all I want to ask is, 
Are you, do you think there's reason for optimism uh, about journalism, if not the business of newspapers? Would you recommend somebody go into this field? Why? Why not? I would. I would. I, I've talked to high school guidance counselors a bunch about this, that you know, a high school senior is telling his mom and dad that he wants to become a journalist and they're scared to death, you know, please go to law school, please become a doctor, please do this. And I think the skills you learn in journalism school are great skills no matter what you do later in life. You learn how to, you know, if you're going to be an attorney, you have to look at tons of information and then write a brief. Same thing as being a good reporter where you get too much information and have to whittle it down into 850 words. You have to hit deadlines. You have to know how to ask questions to people that are smart, um, that are smart questions. You have to know how to um, plan. I mean, there are just a million things that will help you whether you become somebody, a PR professional, a marketing person, or an attorney, any number of, of, of professions. Communication is something that, you know, a good writer, it helps you in many, 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 many fields. So one, I think it's a good field to go into no matter what you do. Number two, I think there's reason for lots of optimism. I'm seeing a lot of smart kids, you know, I was on the University of Missouri who were very excited about going into journalism. They also had a lot of apprehension and I was glad to see both because if they only had excitement I think they were too stupid to become a journalist. It was great that they had apprehension also. Um, but it's, you know, again it's not going to a newspaper sometimes. Sometimes it is. Sometimes it, it's a digital only site. I mean there are a zillion, you know, Scott, I think it was Scott Kurt, asked a question about, Scott did, sorry, of uh, a million different niche publications and there are a million niche publications now that we didn't have when we when your choice was two or three dailies in a city, and that was it. You know, there are a lot more opportunities than there were. They're just very different opportunities. So, like that part, and then the part that scares me, and again, it goes to the question Scott and others have asked, is that, you know, if you can't support a general audience so that, you know, the post-dispatches of the world and the Cleveland Plain Dealers have to become niche only, you know, I, I want investigative journalism about my community. I want somebody covering my community. I want to understand what's happening in my community. And that's what we really need as a society and for a democracy. Okay, thanks. I'm just going to uh, add that I got an email from Joelle Hahn who mm -hmm. indicated mm -hmm. that she was in, the, in, the, in this uh, during the whole time. So for some reason she's not showing up on my on my screen, yep. so I, glad to I see that she was here. <laughs> um, and, and in the meantime, people have, have follow-up we'll follow questions. questions. Just email you or something, Kurt. And if you want to shoot an email to me, I'll be glad to answer follow-up questions for folks or about anything related to this topic. Great, glad to hear it. And uh, we're three minutes past time, so thank you very much, Arnie, for spending the time with us. I uh, really enjoyed this. And uh, I'm sure the students did as well. And the ones who haven't watched it yet, I'm sure they will. So yeah. thank yes. you again. Yes. Tail. Tail. From your cat. Thanks. Take care. Thanks again. Bye, everybody. Bye, everybody. Bye.